Okay, we are live. I want to thank Bill Blom. Uh, this guy is amazing. Uh, he's running our uh, tech. Guys, you're looking good. Merry Christmas to you, coach, to your family. Ronnie, uh, Tom, Colonel, Joe, uh, they've put together a luncheon today. Uh, Ronnie, if they come between 11 and 1, like, is that good enough? Yeah. Okay, 11 to 1, come and go. Ronnie's about to come lead us in prayer. Uh, but we'll have a great time. Ladies will be, in, uh, will be joining us. Uh, and I came up yesterday while they were preparing, and I don't know if it's the onions or what. It smelled amazing. Uh, so best beef you'll ever have. This is our second annual Astoria Christmas party. Um, I just appreciate your support of Astoria. Thank you for being a part this year. I have a lot of fun. Uh, and those of you who are watching online, your notes of encouragement mean uh, so much. We get a little rowdy in here. Uh, we go back and forth. We don't always agree. Uh, but, Coach, uh, the thing that people have commented on, they love listening to discussion from people with different viewpoints. And there's respect and love, uh, but there's also challenges. And they say, well, you don't get that very often because if you disagree, you're like, go somewhere else. Well, yeah, if you, if you disagree, come here. You'll find at least one or two others that agree with you. We've all been kicked out of somewhere, so you're coming here. So today, I hope they didn't hear that. Today, today, Revelation uh, chapter uh, six. And, I, and I have to say, Doc, don't get the big head. And Tim, we'll have some comments. I'll bring him down. He'll bring him down. <laughs> Victory, huh? Yeah. I have to say, his commentary on Revelation 6 was some of the best I have ever read. And um, very few people agree with him about the identity of the writer of the white horse in verse 2. We're going to discuss it. But he convinced me, and I'm going to show you some things from Zechariah. Uh, there's basically three alternatives to who the rider on the white horse with a crown and a bow is. And Ronnie, come on up. We'll have prayer time. Here are the alternatives. And for those of you watching, We'll have a brief devotional prayer time. You can go ahead and open to Revelation 6. Here are the three options. The Antichrist, that's the view of dispensationalists. Jesus Christ, that's the view of historic Christianity commentators on Revelation. And Christians, a symbol of followers of Jesus who go out and conquer through the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the kingdom during times when the world is falling apart. That's Doc's view. So we're going to discuss all three. <coughs> Most evangelical pastors that you listen to will tell you it's the Antichrist or a world leader uh, on the white horse in Revelation 2. Some said it was Napoleon. Some said it was Hitler. Some say it's a future Antichrist. But we're going to talk about why this chapter is so important to the concept of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Ronnie, come on up. Lead us. Mm -hmm. All righty. Uh, uh, we need to take care of real quick. We won't meet again until January 9th, I believe. Correct. So we're going to take off two weeks so people can enjoy their time with family and travel and what have you. Also, there's booklets on the table for our prayer requests because we don't announce them. In, uh, very few do we announce in uh, in the room here because of since we're broadcasting live. And if you notice, I, I carry my phone around with me because I do attendance on this thing. So today is a little lesson real quick before I do a prayer. How many in here <coughs> have their phone with them? I set my phone down, weary of the constant bombardment of image, ideas, and notifications that the little screen 
broadcast. Then I picked it up and turned it on again. Why? The internet has shaped our relationship with stillness. What the net seems to be doing is chipping away our capacity for concentration and contemplation. Whether we are online or not, our mind now expects to take in information the way the net distributes it. <clears throat> Challenging or changing our habits starts with a choice to be still, even if we must make the choice over and over again. We can ex then experience God's uh, satisfi satisfying goodness. How does technology influence our ability to rest quietly before God? And that includes AI. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, for, Father, for the opportunity that we can come before you, Lord. And Father, there are times when we need to be still and be able to listen to your guiding Holy Spirit. Father, we are a group of men that come to learn, to hear, and to grow what you have intended for us. Father, also, this time of the year, help us to remember what the true meaning of Christmas is. One of the miracles that you gave us when you sent your son to be born as a, as a baby and a virgin. Mm -hmm. So, Father, help us to always remember that. Father, as we go into the lesson today, may you be with us. May you touch our hearts, open up our hearts, our minds, our ears, and even our mouths. So, Father, that we can worship you and give you the loving that you deserve. Yes. In Christ Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ronnie. Ronnie. Okay, well, let's get started. And um, Tim and Doc, uh, you can have some preliminary comments before we start reading. Uh, I'm just going to give some, some background uh, to this chapter, and then we will attempt to, to read um, the entire chapter, but I can almost guarantee you we will not finish it uh, today. Um, so, Billy Graham uh, wrote a book called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and he based it upon this chapter saying that the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse represent four global events that will come in the future right before Jesus Christ returns. Death, war, famine, uh, disease, and collapse of governments. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, Tim will tell you, I'm just preparing you so that you know, that Revelation 6, yes, it's about war, and it's about three years of economic uh, deterioration, famine. Uh, yes, it is about the destruction of a government, but it's compacted within a three-year time period called the Roman Jewish Wars from 67 to 70 AD. And this is Yahweh's judgment on the nation of Israel. And then the kingdom blossoms uh, after that destruction of the nation of Israel. A 40-year period of transition from the death of Christ until the destruction of the nation of Israel. That's called preterism. That's his view, and he's probably the best teacher you'll ever hear on it. Uh, most evangelicals will tell you what Billy Graham wrote about. This chapter hasn't yet happened. It's coming. We don't know who the rider on the white horse is, but he is the Antichrist. And people who've agreed with Billy Graham's idea have identified through the course of the last 150 years, as I said, different people as that man because they thought they were in the end times. Napoleon was one of the first. Mm -hmm. Hitler... Now people are saying it's Putin. You know, it, it just, it, yeah, it, it's like so many Christians get their theology from the newspaper rather than from the Scripture. <coughs> Doc's view of the rider on the white horse is that it is you and me sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ 
during cyclical events in the world of economic collapse, wars, it always happens, um, famine, disease, we come in with the gospel of peace and we conquer a fallen world through sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Now we'll come. Those are the three basic views. And you're going to fall within one of those views. Uh, and whichever one is right. So you don't get some weird interpretation before you start reading. Good point, Brian. You know, so many Christians in the 1940s and 50s read the Schofield, Schofield notes, notes at the, at the bottom, bottom of their Bible more than they did the Bible. It's like, okay, this is what Schofield says. I believe it. Well, Ryan's point is read the Scripture. Now, having said that, there is one date that you've, you must remember in your study of Revelation. Uh, whether you believe Revelation 6 refers to it or not, Doc doesn't, Tim does, uh, whether you believe it or not, you need to know this date. It's the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 by the Roman army. This is a huge date in an understanding of Scripture. For example, when Jesus predicts in Matthew, to his disciples, when they go to the Mount of Olives and they're looking at the temple complex that Herod had remodeled from Zerubbabel's small temple, King Herod of the Jews had made it a massive wonder of the world. And all the disciples are saying to the Messiah, look, this is beautiful. Isn't this grand? And Jesus says, I tell you, not one stone will be left standing upon the other. And, and you, then you start listening to what Jesus says about what's going to happen. He makes this statement at the end of all the description of what will happen before Jerusalem is destroyed. This generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Now, I think every biblical scholar, including Doc, myself, Tim, people, John Gill, John Calvin, we all know Jesus is talking about this date because within 40 years, a Jewish generation, the temple was destroyed and not one stone was left standing upon another because the Romans pulled them down. Okay, but too many evangelical Christians change that word generation to human race. And that's not the word. Uh, they say the human race will not cease to exist until all these things happen. No. It's a generation of time. Okay, so I tell you that because before we start reading, Tim and Doc, uh, be ready with your comments in just a second. We are coming to the time when the scroll is opened. And in Revelation 5, the question is, who is worthy to open the scroll? And you guys did a great job last time answering the question, what is this scroll? And Curtis and others of you said, this is life. This is history. This is the universe. This is the scroll of everything. You know, that's what Einstein and uh, uh, who was the disabled guy in uh, the wheelchair at the sign? Hawking. Stephen Hawking, the theory of everything. This is what they're looking for. It's the scroll. Who's worthy to open it? Only the King of Kings and Lord of Lords the Creator, Yahweh Himself, the little Lamb, as we'll see in Revelation 6. Emmanuel, God with us, the Lion from the tribe of Judah, man as He should be, the Creator on earth. He comes 
takes the scroll and begins to open. I showed you that the seven seals could be like this. The first seal, you open it, unroll the scroll, you come to the second seal, you open it, so it's a progressive volume. Okay, that's, that's one way you could look at it. Most Christians, including you, see the seven seals this way. One scroll with seven seals on the outside. And you know what? It could be this. So what we have here in Revelation 6 is the first seal is broken. And there's a white horse with a rider and a crown and a bow. And the word is go. Now, I know it says in your text, come and see. Doc does a great job saying, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not come and see. It's more a command, an imperative. Go! And the white horse goes with the rider to conquer. <laughs> then you get the second seal broken. <laughs> then you get the red horse. Go! Then you get the black horse and the pale horse. Go! Then the fifth seal are those who have died through war and famine, those who know Christ. And they're asking the question, how long? And Yahweh says, hang on, I've got a plan. Then you get the sixth seal open. The seventh seal is then open. We're going to read all seven seals being open. I think the concept of this chapter is simply, <coughs> Yahweh's on His throne and He has a purpose. Tim believes everything we're reading is fulfilled in AD 70. That's called preterism, from the Latin, having been fulfilled. Uh, Doc and I see more of a cyclical fulfillment, uh, and we'll explain that in just a second. But Tim, you're going to go first. Most of you have been raised... But it's coming when the Antichrist comes. So, Tim, preliminary comments before we read. What do you think? Well, I, it seems to me that the only reason why we look at it as periods of history is because we've been told that's what it is. Tell us every detail that is predicted in here happens in the three years that included the Jewish war with Rome and the siege of Jerusalem. Every one of its documented historical fact. Where Billy Graham gets the idea is from a system that says that all this is going to happen sometime in the future. Rome <laughs> has to rise to power again. <clears throat> Babylon has to rise to power again. This is, in my mind, beyond the pale. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Why? Because it obviously, historically documented fact it's already happened. That's the reason why. I mean, it's the it's these kinds of things. I, I challenge you, read Josephus. It's, I mean, the descriptions match this word for word. And it's so, it, it, to me, it's just too much to, to go beyond. Uh, I think that the way, I agree with you, the way Doc has covered this chapter is so thorough, and, and the way he gives the different, the historicists and the preterists and the spiritual, those are invaluable to, for you to make up your mind. But let me tell you this. Don't just read those four visions and say, well, I like, this one feels the best to me. I like it best. What does the text say? That's what you have to decide. Now, all four views think they're telling you what the text is. But one is, to me, that, you know, obviously the Predators is based on the historical, factual information of what happened. And uh, then, so then you look at the facts of what happened, and you say, oh, so that's what that was pointing to. So there's lots that, and I'll have more to say. Yeah, in the and future. we'll we'll come back. Good, very good, Tim. By the way, uh, I just want to be. If you, I've never heard anybody teach the Preterist view better than Tim, but most evangelical church would uh, churches would see Tim as a heretic. That is absolutely absurd. Just listen to him, and let the text drive your view. Doc, preliminary comments. Well, I agree with, with uh, Tim. I think 
I've said many times. Merry Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> Miracles still happen. We're going to have to write that down. <laughs> yeah, I'll write that down. <laughs> Go ahead, Doc. We're sorry. Well, if I was advising a student to come in to study New Testament, what's a good introduction to it? I would say quickly, read Josephus, The Jewish War. Man, it's the clearest, beautiful story that they used to say, no, that didn't happen. I was taught that. Wow. It, that, the story about Masada, no, that's made up. Josephus made that up. And our Navy planes in the, at the end of the Second World War flew over Masada and took pictures. And what was his name? Yadin? Yeah. The head of the IDF, whatever. Yeah. He saw that and he got out of the military and became an archaeologist and went down and investigated, and it's exactly what Josephus said. I mean, you can't believe it. Every detail was fulfilled. So I say, read that. And it's such a good introduction, all these things going on around yes. when the New Testament was written. But Tim is so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Where is there anything here about the kingdom being destroyed or being reestablished. No, this is just something I put on the front of this commentary. No, Wade puts this on how they put unveiling of the day of Yahweh. So we've been reading in the Hebrew Bible about the day of Yahweh. When does it come? It comes all the time. It's not one day. It, well, it's one day that just happens again and again and again, and that's what you have but, but here. But let me, let me defend Tim for just a moment, no, Doc. No. Yeah, defend let me defend me. Tim. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this. Is he not right in that this is a day of Yahweh <laughs> yes. for the nation of Israel? No, for all the world. I There's nothing... That to the text. This doesn't say Jerusalem in the text. It doesn't mention anything about the temple being destroyed. I challenge you to find where the temple is destroyed in the book of Revelation. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll concede that. But let me ask you this. You're saying it's all the world cyclical. I agree with you. But I also agree with Tim that this is written to Jews, as we saw in Revelation 2 and 3, basically encouraging them that when conflict, war, famine, pestilence, destruction comes, Yahweh's on his white horse. Be encouraged. Don't lose your hope. So let me ask if I can get you to concede at least one point. Even if it's not mentioned, could Tim not be right saying the Jewish wars apply to Revelation 6? Sure. There we go. And I well, figured you would say that. That's all we're talking about. And yeah. I said, no, no, Tim. Yeah. No. Much more than that. Yeah, no, no. Right. Okay, if you didn't hear online, Doc said, sure. But what Doc then followed up on is saying, but Tim says that's all it's I, I owe it to you with a few comments, and then I'm going to take you to Zechariah. And I'm going to show you something in Zechariah, because if you don't understand the Hebrew Scriptures and how they relate to Revelation 6, you'll always be lost. So let's read, and then it's, it's your time to ask questions to Tim and Doc and myself. Here we go, verse 1. Then I, John the Revelator, saw the Lamb. In Greek, it is little lamb. Little lamb. Not a lamb, a little lamb. This, of course, is Yeshua, who's also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. This is a metaphorical description. Why a little lamb? The Hebrews would have known instantly why the Messiah is called a little lamb. They had to bring a little lamb to sacrifice for their family. If they were too poor, they brought two turtle doves. This is the little lamb, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Let's go on. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying as with a voice of thunder, Come. Now, Doc does a great job in his commentary saying, Look, this is an ambiguous Greek word. 
and he, he's convinced me beyond a shadow of a doubt. Some translators add, let me ask by a show of hands, how many of you have in verse 1 the phrase, come and see? One, two, three, four, five, six. Doc says, um, those are added. NAS puts a number one there to make you look down below to show you that some manuscripts read, come and see. But Doc shows you how it's just a one word imperative. Imperative means command. So, could it be come? It could be. But Doc says, and I believe, it's go. Because what you have here is the sending out of four horsemen. Now, who's the living creature? It's a big subject of debate. And, and Doc will get on to me for this. In the Mishnah, the Jews for centuries have told us the symbols or the standards of the four major divisions of the twelve tribes. And the standards or flags where they all camped were images of the four living creatures. An ox, a lion, a man, and an eagle. And these are the... So what you have here is... And Doc says... Jerusalem, the Jews are not mentioned, Israel's not mentioned. Symbolically, I think they are. These are the Jews. And the early church said constantly, all these early church fathers, that's the four Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Doc, Doc is right. Well, some of them, uh, I, I have a note on mine that instead of come, it's just the word see, which would be a command. See? Right. Yeah, good point. Yeah, but that command would be speaking to John, right? Right. Yes. I think that the I think that when he says come, he's saying to that horse, come. Yeah. It's your turn. Come. Yep. Then the next one that and notice that it's the lion, the face of the lion that calls this horse. Mm -hmm. It's the face of the ox that calls the second horse. Mm -hmm. It's the face of the man that these four living creatures yes. each call one of these horses. Yes. That's what's going on. It's, it, it's, it's, it's basically the leaders of Jerusalem. However, Doc's right. The early church father says these are the four gospels. <coughs> yeah. Okay, verse 2. Both are reading it. Yeah. The text doesn't say. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed, Doc. Is it a Mark or Peter? Well, yeah, there we go. Let's go on. Verse 2. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now let me show you something about the crown. The crown in the Greek language was not what you're thinking of, like things you see in visual illustrations uh, of this gold uh, crown. Oh, you know what? I thought I had a copy. I don't. Um, this white horse, Billy Graham, I think, this is a, th this is different than the other three. The crown is a leaflet, a wreath. When you won a race, they put it on your head. You were the victor. By the way, th this is what Paul constantly speaks about. I have run the race with perseverance, to receive a crown of victory. And Doc says, listen, throughout Revelation, white is the number for righteousness and good. The number for God's people in the fifth seal, God's people are clothed in white. This white horse doesn't represent anything but good and righteousness. And the person on the back has a crown. He's a victor. And so Doc says, there's also a bow. Arrows are implied. What is the arrow in the Word of God? It is the Word of God. So here you have the conqueror going out into the world. And he says, that's you who follow Jesus Christ. You go out and you preach the gospel. And you know... Yeah. Um, he who sat on the horse he judges and wages war, you know, bow and arrow and all that kind of stuff. A 
course, that is Jesus, but this may or may not be. Well, and the reason... Agreed. Agreed. It, it may, may or may not be. Some say it is Jesus. But here you've got the lamb, the little lamb, opening the scrolls. Each of the four creatures shouting, either come, see, go to the horseman. And the first one who shouts says, go and conquer. Guys, if that is us, let me tell you something. You don't need a gun. You don't need to fight with your hands. You go out with the word of God and you watch people's lives be transformed. That's what's happening to us in here. Agreed. I think the ones I've met, Tim, Wade says, well, you convinced me. I didn't convince him of anything. The text convinced him. I think that's happened to all of us. Agreed, Doc. And I see, I'm getting to know a lot of you guys, and I see a lot of change. Really, isn't it? Not Tom, but the rest. You know. yeah. <laughs> oh, he couldn't resist. Come on, Tom. Oh. <laughs> because I want to <laughs> All right, verse 3, here we go. Now notice, when he, NAS capitalizes he. I think that's appropriate. It's the little lamb. It's the lamb of God who takes away the... He's opening the scrolls. So Howard mentions the rider on the white horse in Revelation 19. We know it to be the Messiah. And, but there's a difference. There's multiple crowns on that rider in Revelation 19. Only one here. Uh, there's a sword from his mouth in Revelation 19. There's a bow here in the hands of the writer. So, when he, the little lamb, broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come, or go, or see. Doc, what's the Greek word there? Urku. It just, and what do you believe it means? Come. Okay. Could it mean go? I think so, but... Yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I, <laughs> Verse 4. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth. Listen to this now. To take peace from the earth, that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. This is war. This is the removal of peace and prosperity and security. And there's war. This is, only the, this is the first of only two times when the color red is mentioned in Revelation. The other time is the red dragon that we'll come across. But notice, it's the taking of peace from mankind. Now, listen to me very carefully. The reason your evangelical pastor says this has to be the Antichrist, it can't be Jesus, is because... Jesus would never take peace from the earth because he's the prince of peace. Well, it's the red horse doing this, not the white horse. It's the red horse, but who is sending the red horse? Doc? The little lamb. The little lamb. And Doc does a good job showing this. He and I and Tim are all in agreement. Listen to me. The peace here, the prosperity here, is this idea that we can live our lives and have comfort and be at peace with no thought of God. Yahweh takes that away. Why? To draw people Exactly as you described it, that's what I'm eating right here. Another horse firing red went out and it was granted to one. We go back to uh, two. We have he that is capitalized and it is specific and direct. We understand that whenever we're trying to learn the word. But we go down to four, there's no discussion of God at all. Correct. Absolutely no discussion. No, no. And by the way, <coughs> we studied Ezekiel. Ezekiel. We, we stu studied Isaiah. Uh, I'm going to show you Zechariah in just a moment. The concept of the red, black, and pale horse going out to take peace from the world so the conqueror comes in and people follow him, is throughout Hebrew history. Tim is saying this is happening to Jerusalem right now, or in 67 to 70 A.D. That's what he's referring to. Doc is saying, yes, I concede, 
but it happens over and over again to all nations. And that's my view. I think the world right now is entering in to one of these cycles. So I'm excited because great revival always comes after the red, the black, and the pale horse are sent out by the little lamb. Let me add Go ahead, Tim. Look in verse 3, it says, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature. Who's the second living creature? Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to list back and forth. It's the ox. Okay? What was the main purpose of the ox? It was usually a beast of burden, but it was also the bull was the primary sac- form of sacrifice. Well, notice that he's given what's translated to be a sword, but the word is actually macharia, I think, if I'm pronouncing that right, which is a dagger. This is a tool used. To slaughter, you know, they slaughtered their sacrifice. Uh, and the connection to this is going to come back later. The whole thing is talking about sacrifice. Who's going to be discovered In just a few verses, the martyrs are going to be underneath the altar. Why would they be underneath the altar? Because the altar is a place of sacrifice. So in a sense, those who die in the war are being sacrificed in the birth pains of the transition that I'm making. Now I know Doc's going to say I'm adding all that to Scripture, but I think the pictures are obvious because of the text, because of the wording. Uh, later on, you're going to see Jesus. I mean, if it's the Lamb who's opening the seal, then how is it the Lamb who opens the seal must set it down and then go get on a white horse to ride it out here? This is not Jesus. This is just simply saying, these are terrible things which are going to happen. And they include famine, war, all of this stuff is included in here. None of it's that specific. It's just saying, this is bad news for the future, guys. Mm-hmm. And it's coming upon you right now. Let's not forget, this is the context of this passage is first century. Written to churches that existed going through this. Wholeheartedly agree. Don't lose that. Tom, question? I've got a question about for Doc about the last sentence in verse 3. My translation says, and a large sword was given to him, not a dagger. So what is what does the Hebrew say? It's written in Greek. Or Greek, yeah, sorry. In verse 3? Verse 3, four, last. Four, 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 is, it, three. is it dagger or sword? Sorry, it's verse 4. Okay, last sentence, verse 4. Yeah, Look it up. It's dagger. Yeah. What, it's what, not t- so, what, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't get the big I'm sword. Arguing, yeah, I'm not right. arguing what you said. I just want to know if my translation yeah, is right. I'm just saying when I looked it up in the lexicon, it, <laughs> the it dagger, was, like dagger, dagger was used for sacrifice. And then when I looked that up, the dagger was used to sl- to cut the throat, and then after the thing had been dyed and bled, was used to dissect or cut the animal up yeah, in pieces. Right. They would remove the fatty pieces to set on the on the fire. Mm-hmm. That's the Lord's <laughs> part. And then the rest would be added later on, and then that's the part that the priests and the people consume. Well, let's let's continue. Verse 5, because... The slaughtering is not sacrifices. They're slaughtering one another. Right, I think... I th- he agrees. I think what Tim is saying is this. Later on, we're going to come to it. Some of God's people have been slaughtered. and And what Tim is saying is, there's going to be some slaughter here in 67 to 70 A.D. And Tim, we don't have time now, but I want to talk to you about that text where Jesus says, My followers shall all escape and not one shall be harmed. But we'll, we'll come to that. That's in Matthew. Verse 5. When he, that's the little lamb, broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse... And he who sat on it had a pair of scales. Now, scales in the day of John, uh, you would put weights on one side, then you'd put what you were buying on the other side, 
and, and you would balance out the scales according to weight. I saw scales in his hand, and I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a Daenerys, three quarts of barley for a Daenerys, and do not damage the oil and the wine. This is the first mention of Bidenomics in the history of the world. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. This, this is basically inflation, famine. And, and, and by the way, guys, I, I, I went and delivered some books to save money for Astoria. I went and delivered books all over uh, Enid rather than mailing them. I told Rochelle, I said, every pastor ought to be out in every street of Enid on a regular basis. Uh, guys, God has blessed you, but there is some poverty in this city. There is some poverty. And the only way we can conquer that is to go talk to people about Jesus. And that's, if Doc's right, that's who we are as we go out in the midst of inflation. We tell people that those who know Jesus have every need met. I have never seen the righteous go hungry. Verse 7. The way that word yeah. denarius is a day's wage. Day's wage. Mine, day's mine wage. about the nutrition, the value of wheat versus barley. And of course, barley is what's most expensive. That's now, good. So it says the one quart would feed a person for a day, but barley is three quarts, so that would barely feed a family. Wow. Nutritionally. So mine has some of those. Very good. And let's not forget that in Ezekiel, we talked about your food's going Absolutely. to be measured out. This is what happens during a siege. I mean, you, food has to be rationed because it's, it's just not there. By, by the way, Howard, we'll come to you in 10. Thank you for taking us back to Ezekiel because here's the deal. In Hebrew literature, every nation being judged by Yahweh, the same thing happens. Babylon, Egypt, Ethiopia, Cush. Israel in 586. It's this language. And this white horse of conquest yeah. is, is pretty much the same thing that happened right. in Ezekiel. It was, you know, Assyria came on Israel, yep. then Babylon comes yep. on Israel. This is Yahweh using nations, a, nations to, to judge. judge his people. There you go. Howard. Two thoughts. It says, a voice from the center of the four living creatures. If we go back to chapter 4... The throne was in the midst of the four living creatures. And oh, so very good. We got the voice coming from the throne of God. Um, very good. There. Secondly, uh, some of the commentators compare and contrast wheat and barley are necessities for life. Oil and wine are, what shall I say, the uh, not the necessities. The, and so a difference between the poor folks are barely getting by and a place is hurting bad. And the rich people with all the surplus, and it doesn't hurt them at all. Howard, brilliant comment. It's a separation of society into the, the uber rich. rich and those, as you combine what Stan said to what Doc said, those who earn a day's wages and can't even put enough food on their table for their family. Which is exactly what happens in inflation. That, that, it's going that, on right now. Well, that's that's why we think it's cyclical, but I would never discount what Tim is saying, that the primary application is the jewish Romans War 67 seven. Let's go on. Well, We're going to let me throw in something that goes uh -huh. with what Howard said. The reason why it says don't harm the oil and the wine is because this is not a natural famine which is caused by drought or something. This is a famine that's caused internally by strife. It's, they burned, if you read the history of it, they had enough food and water in, in Jerusalem to last for years. They fought amongst themselves and burned their food. That's why they had a famine. Sounds like good politics. It's created <laughs> by... It's a very good observation. It's because it's not a natural famine. This is a, this is a yeah, so out famine. Out of famine, they moved to cannibalism. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 It was the same thing. Uh -huh. They built that big ramp up there, and some of us had been there. And so when they finally got to the top, they had 
all the water and all the um, mm -hmm. wheat and everything for years mm -hmm. and years, and they burned all the wheat, mm -hmm. but they, you know, so they could see mm -hmm. that it had been there, yeah. but they, they left the water there, you know, and so they could have held out for years and years and years. Yeah. Right. By the way, so far, we don't want to assume that you know what Howard is saying is this. When the, the Roman Romans destroyed Jerusalem, AD 70, a lot of the Jews fled with their wives and kids to Masada and stayed up on this mountain that Doc is absolutely right, our Navy discovered after World War II. Uh, they stayed up there on that huge mountain for three and a half years. Three and a half years. B big symbol there of three and a half that we'll come to later. And then the Romans built ramparts. And when they got in, everyone had committed suicide. And they found, all the Jews had committed suicide, they found one woman who had hid. And she told Josephus, the historian traveling with the Romans, what happened. The men, the Jewish men, drew lots. And the last man standing killed the other men who killed their wives and their children with the sword, the dagger. Then the last man with the lot killed the other men. Then he killed himself. Why did they do that? Because in Jewish religion, if you commit suicide, you have no hope of paradise. So that man who drew the lot did that. But here's what's interesting. I don't know if any of you in this room were with us. It was years ago because we've been a dozen times. But we were on top of Masada with a group from Enid when these helicopters came in and landed on Masada. And special forces for IDF get out and they stand at attention and you see them raise their hand. And in Hebrew, they take the oath of allegiance to Israel. And at the very end, they say these words in Hebrew, No more Masada. You know what that means? Mm -hmm. That means the Jews will wipe anybody out that tries to wipe them out. They're not, and that's their mentality. All right, let's finish. I'm just going to read two verses, and then I know some of you got to go, and we're almost out of time, but I, I got to show you Zechariah. Verse 7. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, or a pale horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword or dagger, with famine and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. Now, guys, wild beasts is not lions, not tigers, Wild beasts are the, is the Hebrew apocalyptic phrase referring to wicked political leaders. And I can show you this. Turn to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 6. Doc points this out. By the way, if you've not read his commentary, you've got to go back and, 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 and read it. In fact, I've got to do this very quickly because of time. Before we do Zechariah 6, do Zechariah, Zechariah uh, 1. Zechariah 1. Yeah, thank you. Okay, verse 1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, we have the year. We can tell you the exact year when Zechariah the prophet of Yahweh. Uh, this is during the Persian reign after the Jews had been released from Babylonian captivity. Look at verse 8 now. I saw at night, behold, a man was riding on a red horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? And the messenger who was speaking to me said, I will show you what these are. Remember what myrtle, what trees are in Scripture. Trees are a picture of human beings. You have a red horse in the middle. This is war. Okay, then you go on, and he sees a white horse and a black horse. Because of time, turn over to Zechariah 6. We have an explanation on what Zechariah uh, the prophet uh, sees. Verse 1, Now I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming forth from between the two mountains. And the mountains were bronze mountains. It's a vision. The first chariot was pulled by red horses. 
The second chariot was pulled by black horses. The third chariot pulled by white horses. The fourth chariot, strong dappled horses or pale horses. Then I spoke and said to the angel, what are these? Now listen to what the messenger from Yahweh says. These are the four spirits of heaven going forth after standing before the Lord of all the earth with one of which the black horses are going forth to the north, the white is going forth after them, the dappled going to the south. And when the horses went out, they were eager to go to patrol the earth. And he said, go, go throughout all the earth. Then he, Yahweh, cried out to me and spoke to me saying, see, these who are going to the land of the north, Ornate crown, set it on the head of Joshua, the, the son, son of Jehoshadak, the high, the high priest. priest. Okay, okay, and, and then, then you go on, and, and the, the crown, crown, verse 14, 14, will become a reminder in the temple of Yahweh uh, to the men of Jerusalem. And uh, guys, here's what Zechariah is seeing. The same thing John is seeing. And there's a passage, and, and Doc points it out. There's a passage uh, in Zechariah where Zechariah is hearing from Yahweh. And this is, this, Tim, is what Yahweh says to Zechariah. The nations have come against my people, my rebellious people, because I sent them, but they have gone too far. Therefore, I am sending the horses, death, famine, to humble the proud. See, guys, when you understand the Scripture, you see Revelation is saying the same thing. Doc, you agree? Yeah. But the book of Zechariah is a mysterious book to me. I, I love the prophets, but Zechariah, little boy, would take this. <laughs> Questions, <laughs> comment. We've got about three or four more minutes. Anybody have a thought, so comment? This is just the same horses at a different time using the same methods. Boom! And boom. That's why I keep saying it's cyclical. Now, I, but I'm not disagreeing with Tim. What Tim is saying is the, the nation, nation of Israel, Israel is key. It, the, the scriptures are about Israel. This primarily is about the nation of Israel. They're coming down. But the king of Israel is the king of all the nations. And the people of Yahweh are the people of Yahweh in all the nations. Take heart, Israel. I'm on my white horse. So I don't disagree with Tim. I teach preterism, but I'm a partial preterist because where Tim, I'm not sure where he falls with me on this, I see it cyclical for all nations throughout history. So if somebody says to me, wait, do you believe the world could go into a time of inflation and famine and war and pestilence and death? Are you kidding me? Are you reading the newspaper? <laughs> but you know what? That happened in the 1940s. And a great revival came in the 1950s. That happened in the 1860s. And a great revival came. A great awakening in the 1870s. Every time this happens, the kingdom advances. Because the proud are brought low and the humble are exalted. Tim and then Stan. Well, I'm not denying that what you're saying is true. But what I'm saying is that's not what Revelation is talking about. Now, if you agree with Doc on his approach, and, and the way he writes this up is beautiful, it's, uh, it's just really close to the historicist way to look at Revelation. Because you're actually taking historical events, and you're kind of leaving them in the fog, and you're saying this is the people of God going out to conquer by the use of the gospel. And that's a fact. It is a fact. But that's not what this is talking about. Primarily. Well, exclusively. In my opinion, <laughs> it's not talking about world history. Okay, but let me, let me say... And to take the view that you have done, you must apply it to world history. No, do agree, Tim. By the way, this is our fundamental difference, but I'll say this to you, Tim. See, I'm, I'm saying you're right. Primarily. 
But I'm saying there's a secondary fulfillment, and it's the world. Because I can show in Hebrew Scripture, Isaiah 7. Primarily, it's the birth of a king to save Israel in the days of Isaiah. fulfillments dual fulfillment so I'm trying to tell people listen to Tim listen to Tim because primarily he is spot on but I'm also even going further saying there's secondary application to the world could I be right I don't know coach but I will tell you this because I believe this so firmly in my heart I had to quit pastoring and start telling the world and my kids, judgment is coming. And then, come alongside them. Pull back the arrow of God's word. See, I don't think, Brian, I couldn't. I don't want people who gather every Sunday to hear judgment. I want them to hear the grace of God. That's, that's what, what you do. That's, that's what I did, did for 30, 30 years. years. But right now, I have this call to pull the arrow back. And say, guys, judgment is coming. Not, not to you. Your judgment's been taken care of. It's to the proud. It's to the haughty. It's to the people who think they can fly the rainbow flag at the Capitol. And shake their fist in the face of God. That's why I had to get out of pastoring. Jim. You mentioned fulfillment. Of Zechariah, he talks about the future blessing that's contingent upon obedience. And what is the future blessing as far as that is concerned? What is the motivation of the, of the future, of the blessing of the future? And that's kind of tying in with what it all is. three of them are saying. Absolutely. Yeah, and by the way, Jim, let me say this. You guys are brilliant. Let me say this to uh, a, a, a tremendous, tremendous leader for our country, Jim. And by the way, just a word of compliment. Ronnie, a couple that really needs discipleship, and he sent me an update. Uh, man, Doc, that's how this little group is changing the world. But Jim, you've put your finger on something. I want to go and hear Tim and Ryan, and I want to go hear Grace, because the obedience of Christ is mine. And all the blessings of Christ are mine because of Yahweh's grace. I want to hear that. That's what encourages me. But, Jim, I agree with you. National obedience is different than gospel obedience. National, it's called natural law and the laws of nature. That's different, in my opinion, than the Christian gospel. So, I think we have to be like Zechariah, and like John the Revelator. And we've got to warn the people who are prosperous and at peace that they're about to have it taken away. But then, let the church be ready to come alongside and say, you never should have been depending on them anyway. Depend on Yahweh. Makes sense, Gene? I see you shaking your head. Makes sense. Doc, Tim, last word. Anything? We've, we've got... got I mean, I hope we're not going to, we need to take our time to go through here. Six. Be, because if we if we fly too fast, I agree. we're, we're going to miss a lot. Of okay, Tim, thank you for that caution. We, we will. Back over to verse one. Yeah, I think, I think yeah. let's do that. When, yeah, because after two weeks, we might forget. So we'll come back. Here's our schedule, and Doc will give you the last, last word. word. When, when we, we will come, come back, back January 9th, which is a Tuesday. Uh, pray for Astoria. We're about to do some technological changes through Delane. We're going one gig on internet. We've got to wire it up. And, and I really appreciate Chisholm Broadband. They've been amazing. But we need a little faster internet speed. So we'll be starting that at the end of this week. And Lord willing, by the time you come back, we'll have both systems operating and uh, we'll kick off with Revelation 6. Read Doc's commentaries before you come back. Amen. In, <laughs> amen. Invite people to come with you. Doc, last well, word. I read your dad's commentary, and he says, 
Well, I'm not going to get into all that Greek stuff. It's already been solved by Hendrickson. And Hendrickson wrote a commentary entitled More Than Conquerors. And when I was in the Church of Christ at, in a Christian college, my professor, Homer Haley, used Hendrickson. And Hendrickson holds just what I hold here. And his daddy holds that. And I'm, so I have to call on your dad. Yeah, I will. I'll, but, I'll tell uh, him that. Uh, so, guys, I can't tell you how blessed we are to have you in this room. Uh, you're an encouragement to us. I know some of you don't say much very often, but I can tell you're listening because I see your eyes rolling back in your head, okay? <laughs> so, Merry Christmas to you. Have a Happy New Year, and we'll see you. Come to lunch. Oh, come to lunch. Lunch come here, to lunch. free. Yes, 11 to 1 today. <laughs>